achieved. Welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions. As always, I am your host, Scott Johnson, and on this episode of the show, we're taking a look at the upcoming UFC Fight Night 59, which will take place in Boston, home of my Boston Bruins, and feature a featherweight bout in the main event with Conor McGregor taking on Dennis Seaver. I'll have all four of my main card predictions for you on this episode of the show. All preliminary predictions will be available at kamikazeoverdrive.net. Now you may notice when you head over to my website, you'll see several uh, key improvements on the site as I've done a number of things to try and make uh, my site appear to be you know, more functional and, and at the very least look uh, better. I'm in the process of working on some things. Hopefully it'll be up and running to its full ability in the next uh, couple of weeks to months. Uh, as far as the bat packs, I'm coming off a kind of a weak UFC 182 card. I went 5-6 and six overall, which was pretty disappointing. Uh, and the bat packs didn't do very well, and they were sold exceptionally well. And I, 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 you know, it's disappointing they didn't do as well, considering I had done, you know, exceptional leading up to with over $4,000 in winnings in the three previous events. Uh, one thing I always encourage people to do is don't just buy one bet pack if it doesn't work. Quit right then. Keep with it, stick with it, and see uh, the you know how much progress you will make as uh, you keep going with the bet packs. This gambling is not something that's one in one evening. It's something you've got to win and grind out over a long time. Take the highs with the lows. Either way, uh, I got three, four pretty interesting fights. So let's get to the first prediction. The opening fight of the evening takes place in the UFC's lightweight division as Storm and Norman Park, 21-2-1, battles longtime UFC veteran Gleison Tebow, 39-10-0. Now, Tebow's filling in for Jorge Masvidal, who had to pull out, but Tebow's had about a month and a half uh, preparation for this fight, so really not short notice, as we see a lot of the times actually having one of the other fights on this main card. Now, this is a big step up for Norman Park. He's looking to move to that next level with a win over the first real-name opponent he'll face in his UFC career. For Tebow, he's very much in gatekeeper mode for this matchup. He has been beating a comp combination of rising prospects and veterans, but he loses to upper-level guys like Khabib Nurmagomedov and Michael Johnson, and he actually lost a close one to Evan Dunham as well. Uh, physically, Park's going to have an inch height advantage and an inch reach advantage, but Tebow's size advantage has been well-documented. He's arguably the biggest man in the division, but with that, there are some issues. Cardio is a big question mark for Tebow, and his success seems to hinge upon whether he can fight at a full three rounds, or at the very least get two rounds in the books and hang on for the third round as his conditioning fails. Uh, he has had fights, again, where he's winning, but barely is able to hang on at the end. And considering six of his nine overall losses have come by decision, you can see kind of what the point I'm driving at. Now, Park, he has a moderate, moderate to high output average of 3.81 strikes per minute, but really hasn't pushed that type of pace like Nurmagomedov or like Evan Dunham was able to do to really slow Tebow down quick enough to take advantage of that fight. You know, in his uh, Kazuki Tokodomi fight, it was kind of one of those matchups where it was a little bit grueling, and it actually slowed Park down. You saw him kind of gasping for air near the end of that matchup. Uh, overall, in this bout, I really think the grappling uh, focus... Uh, the grappling aspect of this fight will play a big role. Park is a judo black belt. He has won 12 times by submission. He, currently, he boasts a 94% takedown defense, and he averages 2.4 takedowns at a you know, slightly below average 33% completion rate. For Gleison Tebow, he's a BJ black belt. He has vastly improved his wrestling skills, and he's 12-1 and overall in fights ended by submission. A very impressive 92% takedown defense, and it's much more impressive than Park's 94, considering two Tebow has been facing to hold those numbers, and he averages 4.39 takedowns at a very strong 50 55% completion rate. Uh, looking at Tebow's fight specifically, nine takedowns in his last two fights, which were both victories, and he had to go all the way back to 2010 for the last win that he picked up where he scored less than two takedowns. So it's been a long, so you, you see how heavy he relies on his wrestling. Now, I think Park's judo is going to help him in in the clinch, but it's not going to help him with a shot, as Tebow has a very solid shot from the outside, and that's where he should find success. He's had a lot of success powering through guys and really picking them up and driving them down. And we saw that Norman Park had some trouble with the takedowns of uh, Tokodomi. He spent some time on his back in that matchup, and he seemed very hesitant against Leonardo Silva, simply because he was afraid of being put on his back against a strong top player like Silva. Now, Park has to take advantage of the time spent on his feet with his striking. That's going to be key. He has a decided advantage in strikes landed per minute and strikes absorbed per minute, and he has to make it count. Tebow has, impro Tebow has improved his boxing overall, and he's come out pretty aggressively in recent fights with his striking on the feet, looking to get something done or get ahead on the scorecards quickly. I don't know if that'll be the best pursuit here. Park has, al has also had some issues with as being a bit of a slow starter. We saw him in his last fight, he was a little bit on his heels against Katani, and that's something you know you don't want to do against Tebow, because he he preys on guys who don't who get off to a weak start. Um, 
I think Norman Parks can be rendered fairly one-dimensional because of T-Bow's strong takedown defense. Parks can force to rely solely on a striking here. I don't think that's going to be quite enough to get it done. I think the fight could be close, especially if T-Bow slows down late. But my prediction is Gleison T-Bow to edge out Norman Park. I'll take T-Bow by decision. Our second bout of the night takes place in the UFC's middleweight division is Uriah Primetime Hall. 10-4-0 takes on Lewis Taylor, 11 wins and 3 losses. Now, Taylor's filling in on short notice for Costa Filippo. He's going to have about 2-2.5 two to two and a half weeks of preparation time for this matchup. Filippo pulling out with uh, an injury to his ribs as far as I've uh, heard. Now, Taylor's not new to the UFC even though he's not, not officially fought about inside the octagon. He was in the tough 13 tryouts back in 2010 but failed to crack the list of the cast. He has some big fight experience, or at least big promotion experience. He went 0-2 in strike force with two submissions, uh, both due to punches, losing to Nate Moore in his first outing, and in the main event of one of the strike force challenger cards, he lost to uh, Joe Diesel Riggs, also uh, due to submission, due to punches. Uh, he did fight twice in Bellator as well, going 2-0 with two knockouts, so pretty nice little run there. Uh, it included a first-round knockout of UFC veteran Joe Vitapo. Uh, outside of the bigger promotions, he has a loss to Bellator veteran Perry Filkins, and he's coming off a win over two-fight recent UFC release, Brian Houston, which came by first-round submission. Now, for Uriah Hall, he seems he's picked up back-to-back -back wins, and he appears to have righted the ship as far as his performance, at, at least as of now. Expectations were very high for him coming off the Ultimate Fighter, at least heading into the tournament finals. He certainly didn't meet them, and he's trying to rebuild some of that uh, success. Uh, what we have here primarily is a striker versus wrestler matchup. Hall has a wide variety of striking techniques. He's a karate black belt, and five of his victories have come by knockout overall. Speed advantage will be his, along with the technical striking advantage, and he should have the vastly superior power. Uh, but all is for naught if he doesn't pull the trigger and execute. We've seen that in the past where he's all the tools, he just fails to put it in position. Uh, Taylor has five wins by knockout, but he doesn't have that striking game. That he, that's going to be able to match up with Hall on the feet outside of landing that one punch Hail Mary. He throws a lot of single strikes and he can get stuck on the outside of his opponent's striking as it was the case against Joe Riggs and simply he's not as good against Uriah Hall as, as Uriah Hall is on the feet not, a, not able to execute. For Taylor he needs to turn this fight into a dog fight if he's going to have success. Grind Hall into the cage, take him down, make it bloody, make him second guess and back up and you know really push him. He is a former collegiate wrestler, but you know his lack of speed and I think overall his just inability to close the distance effectively is going to make it difficult for him to shoot and he doesn't have a great takedown game. He does have a solid top game if he's able to get in a position to use it, but Hall's got pretty stout takedown defense as far as we have seen. Now both of his submission losses uh, as I said came due to strikes which doesn't instill a lot of confidence about this fighter. He was also knocked out by Filkin so it really questions his ability to take damage and against a guy like Uriah Hall who can dish it out in waves that is a major concern. Hall needs to fight a very smart fight, use a game plan, don't simply walk into the cage and throw a lot of techniques and hope something lands that ends up on a highlight reel somewhere but I simply put I think the late notice, the debut and the stab up and competition for Haler are, and in the short preparation time are all too much for him to overcome and my prediction is Uriah Hall to defeat Lewis Taylor by TKO. We now have our co-main event of the evening in the UFC's lightweight division and it's really a shame that this fight is not the main event as if it goes you know the distance it would be much nicer to see it go five rounds than three. Uh, we have the number three ranked Donald Cowboy Cerrone 26-6-0 with one no contest taking on the former WEC and former UFC lightweight champion number five ranked Benson Smooth Henderson with a record of 21 wins and four losses. Now this is a rematch of a rematch. The third time these two guys have fought if you can follow me. Cerrone's taking this belt on a very quick turnaround. That's the first thing worth noting here. Two weeks since his victory over Miles Jury, replacing injured Eddie Alvarez, which that would have been an excellent fight as well, and hopefully we'll get to see Alvarez Henderson down the road. Now, Cerrone has pretty much said when asked about taking this fight on such short notice, you know, two weeks really does not give him any time to prepare, just simply enough time to make weight, and says it could be very tough on his body and inhibit his performance, but he wants to fight, he wants that opportunity to get in there and really make up for a lost opportunity that he felt the Miles Jury fight cost him, his jury didn't come to fight, and Cerrone certainly did. Uh, overall, these fighters, despite their past history crossing paths, they are in very much different places. Cerrone is still trying to get that title shot, working his way up. He's having to re he's had to rebound a couple of times from losses, and he's currently riding a pretty impressive six-fight winning streak. For Henderson, he lost his WEC title, went on a tear, won the UFC title, defended it a couple of times, lost to Anthony Pettis again, 
Started the rebound with the win over Josh Thompson, but then got knocked out by Rafael Dos Anjos. So he's really in an interesting position. Nobody's really clamoring to see him fight for the title again, and he needs a bunch of wins before he'll actually be talked about as a, as a legitimate contender, but he certainly could start here. As it Benson under pressure to avoid that further loss and subsequent, he's going to tumble down the ranks. He's already ranked number five, and he could be headed downward with another defeat here. Uh, in their head-to-head matchups, Henderson is 2-0 versus Cerrone. He's defeated them both times. Both belts took place in the WEC in 2009 and 2010. The first fight was for the interim uh, lightweight title and was a fight of the year candidate with Benson Henderson taking a decision and a very close and some people feel controversial decision. I'm one of those people. The second fight was for the WEC title after Henderson took the uh, or unified the titles with Jamie Varner. In this matchup, Benson Henderson won by first-round guillotine far more... Uh, uh, definitive. Cerrone's, it was Cerrone's third WEC title fight loss in just over a year, which was a pretty tough situation for him, and he hasn't had that loss that many fights in such a close proximity since. Uh, since those two fought in their second meeting, Donald Cerrone's gone 15-3 and overall, losing to Anthony Pettis, Rafael Dos Anjos, and Nate Diaz. For Benson Henderson, he's won the title in that time frame, the new UFC title that is. He's gone 9-3 and with two losses against, Anth- against Anthony Pettis and one loss against Rafael Dos Anjos, and he holds a win over Nate Diaz. So they fought fairly similar competition since, and both have looked very impressive. Physically, Cerrone will be four inches taller and have a three-inch reach advantage. Now, Benson's made a career of late of, of winning close fights. Conversely, Cerrone seems to be the type of guy when he wins fights, he wins walkaways. He doesn't mean he doesn't knock the guy out, but he absolutely de- destroys him like KJ Noons, like he did against Jeremy Stevens as well. So looking at Benson Henderson, how does he win this fight? Well, he needs to push the pace. He needs to keep Cowboy backing up, who he's not the same striker when he's backing up. Use his wrestling, put him on the ground, grind him out, and, the, and make him hesitate on the feet. Big thing, exploit that short training camp, really push his conditioning. For the Cowboy, how does he win this matchup? Use his controlled aggression, move forward and attack. Don't overextend himself, heavy kicking arsenal, use his length, counter the forward push of Benson Henderson with a nice stepping knee to really back him off. Test Ben's chin coming off that knockout and be aggressive off his back if he gets taken down. Now, Cerrone traditionally hasn't been a fast starter, but he appears to have remedied some of that in recent matches. It's uh, But he's very hittable at the same time. Uh, on the outside, though, I, Henderson has a good kicking game, comes from that Taekwondo background, but Donald Cerrone is very nasty with his strikes uh, from the, from range. That's a big issue there. Benson standing at kicking range is certainly a mistake in this matchup, and he's going to struggle to get Cerrone's uh, respect on the feet. This is a five-round fight and a quick turnaround. If it, sorry, if this was a five-round fight, the quick turnaround for Cowboy would be an issue. Not so much in the three-rounder, I don't think, but Cerrone can't come out flat early. He needs to get it going, and I think he should be very comfortable, though, seeing as he just fought two weeks ago. Benson, unfortunately, his last couple fights has seemed a little bit hesitant. He's coming off the first knockout loss of his career, but he should have confidence having beaten Cowboy twice. Uh, I think Henderson, you know, in that first match, he relied a big time on his wrestling, uh, and he seems to be, when the first time they fought, he seems to be a very similar fighter. Well, Cerrone has improved vastly since that first matchup. I think Cowboy has the ability to outstrike him on the feet. And my prediction is Donald Cowboy Cerrone to defeat Benson Henderson. I'm going to take Cowboy by TKO. In the main event of the evening, we're in the UFC's featherweight division as the notorious Conor McGregor, 16-2-0, battles Dennis Seaver with a record of 22 wins, 9 losses, and a single no contest. Now, McGregor comes into this matchup as an absolutely massive favorite. The title shot is his if he can win this matchup, and he's fighting in Boston, which arguably, with his Irish background, is his second home. There is a lot of pressure. Added to that pressure, it's self-imposed, self-inflicted. He's made the statement he plans to beat Dennis Seaver in under two minutes. So obviously, you know, a win is a win, but if he, you know, can't come out and execute, especially if he goes to decision, that, uh, you know, future telling as he liked or prognostication as he liked to put it certainly makes him look bad. Now, this is a step overall, I think a little bit of a step back in competition. I like Dennis Seaver. This is a step back in competition for McGregor. He's coming off a very solid victory over De- Dustin Poirier, who's a very top ranked fighter, high, high, highly regarded fighter, more accomplished than Dennis Seaver in the featherweight division, as far as I'm concerned. Now, looking at Seaver, he's a former lightweight, but considering McGregor has fought at that division too, and he's going to have a two inch height advantage and a four inch reach advantage, so physically there aren't really any advantage for Dennis Seaver in this fight. Uh, Seaver's a black belt in Taekwondo, purple belt in BJJ, and a green belt in Judo. So well credited, well diver- a diverse, uh, straight, or diverse combat credentials. He has five wins by knockout, nine submissions, and eight decision victories. He has been KO'd twice and submitted five times in his career. He has a very karate-oriented style of attack. He also comes from a sambo background. We really know a lot about Seaver's kicking arsenal, the turning side kicks, the variety of kicks he can throw, that front leg roundhouse kick. Uh, 
that are you know very difficult to pick up. There's not a lot of wind up. He's a very solid counter striker as well, and he has a very a workable wrestling game, which he's integrated very nicely into his uh, attacks overall. Now McGregor BJJ brown belt, and he's working with Gunnar Nelson, who's a fantastic grappler, and also he has a karate oriented style as well. We've seen that in his you know his positioning, the way he throws his kicks and throws his hands and approaches fighters. He has 14 wins by knockout, which is very impressive. No defeats, telling us he's got a very strong chin. One and two in fights ended by submission and one decision, so he's very capable of ending this fight early, as he has predicted. Twelve first-round victories. Everyone expects Conor McGregor to win this fight. Let's not kid ourselves. Dennis Seaver is expected to simply step aside, let him get that title shot. That's not going to happen, though. So let's you know, let's look at Dennis Seaver and how he wins this matchup. McGregor's very Conor McGregor's very hittable. Two point four six strikes landed per minute by his opponents so far in his career, which just tells us that you know he can be hit. Uh, he, Seaver needs to use that heavy kicking attack, keep McGregor on the outside, counter when he comes in, mix in his wrestling. If, even if he's not successful, force Connor to be defensive-minded on multiple fronts. And if he is successful, put him on his back and go to work attacking. But on the other side of things, Connor's going to have a speed advantage and he's going to have the power advantage. And those have caused Seaver problems in the past. Most notably, you go back to that Cub Swanson matchup where he just could not keep up with what Cub had to offer. Another thing is cardio is a major question mark with Dennis Seaver as well. McGregor's, you know, went three rounds with Max Holloway and won that matchup. Seaver's movement and kind of heavily muscled and a little bit of a stiff striking style don't seem to hold up well when he's pushed and constantly forced to fight and not able to keep the fight at his pace. He does have success when he's able to, you know, to fight it, as I said, at his pace, but you know, I don't expect that's going to be the case here. Another major question mark is the German's chin. He's been knocked out only twice in his career, but we also watched that Donald Cerrone fight where he was uh, clipped with a head kick and dropped before getting submitted. And you have to wonder, you know, if, if if McGregor lands a clean shot, can Seaver hold up? McGregor has massive power. It's been rumored and talked about that he hits like a middleweight, and we certainly saw that in his fight against Dustin Poirier. And he combines it with pressure, and it makes it very difficult for opponents to deal with. That's going to be very difficult even for a seasoned striker like Dennis Seaver, a seasoned kickboxer, to deal with. I think Seaver stylistically is going to have difficulties here, and my prediction is Conor McGregor to defeat Dennis Seaver. I'm going to take McGregor by TKO. So those are my four main card predictions for the UFC Fight Night 59 event in Boston. All my preliminary predictions, as always, will be at kamikazeoverdrive.net. Uh, I've changed up the recording device I use. Still the same microphone, but a different processing program. So let, let me know in the comments if you feel it was easier to listen to in this uh, episode of the show, and if it's worth the extra effort I have to put in to uh, make this all work. Uh, as always, if you're interested in buying the bet packs, certainly consider that. I'm looking forward to you know getting back in the win column, as I'm sure you are as well. Uh, check out everything else on the website. I put some I said put some time into changing the headers a little bit. I'm going to try and add a few new features and clean some things up. If there's anything as always you'd like to see on the website, please you know comment here on the uh, YouTube channel or email me at kamikazeoverdrive at live.ca. And for everyone who tunes in, thank you very much uh, for listening as always, and I'll talk to you here in a very short period of time. Take care.